Welcome to the Be Dadly Podcast, where we discuss all things dadly, from being an entrepreneur while caring for toddlers, to raising screenagers and talking the birds and the bees. We're here to help you traverse the vast and dynamic landscape of fatherhood. Enjoy practical advice, lots of puns, and even a few heart-touching moments. And the dad jokes are pretty good, too. And now your host, Brandon Jones. And just like that, we are back, folks. Welcome back to the Be Dadly Show. I am Brandon Jones, your host, and I actually have Greg Thomas here today. I'm very excited about this guest, you guys. This man is a, uh, he seems like a very bright, intelligent, and accomplished man, and accomplished in the best kind of sense. He is a very accomplished father, has a daughter at MIT, and we're going to get in there and figure out just how he did this. And I uh, also want to tell you a little bit about jazz real quick. Uh, let me, let me read you a quick bio. Greg Thomas is the CEO of the jazz leadership project, a private company that uses the principles and practices of jazz music to enhance leadership success and team excellence. The jazz leadership project, uh, works with firms such as JP Morgan, Chase, Verizon, TD bank, and Google. Thomas has been a professional journalist for over 25 years. He is currently a senior fellow of the Institute of, for Cultural Evolution. He recently taught a course on cultural intelligence and co-facilitated a six-month class titled Stepping Up, Wrestling with America's Past, Reimagining Its Future, Healing Together. As a social entrepreneur, Thomas co-produced a two-day broadcast, Combating Racism and Anti-Semiticism Together, Shaping an Omni-American Future, in October 2021. He serves on the advisory board of the Consilient Project and FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. He is the father of Kaya Thomas, a brilliant and beautiful young woman who is currently a joint MBA and engineering graduate student at MIT. Thank you so much, Greg, for being with us. And thank you for correcting that little mess up with the uh, jazz thing. <laughs> I'm seeing the that email is jazz. Well, listen, if, uh, you know, if I'm called jazz, I, I don't mind that since jazz right. is such an important part of my whole existence, um, avocation, vocation, everything. So I don't mind that at all. And thank you for having me on your show, Brandon. I'm very honored to have you on. I I uh, was looking into what you do and I was just like, man, we have got a really cool guest. I mean, there's there are a handful of times where I get guests on that just really, really, really excite me. And it's because of their mindset, their leadership, uh, their excellence, and just their commitment to uh, being a great person and really propelling the future. And I, uh, I was reading through your bio, reading through your website, watching some of your videos, and I was really excited about this opportunity. And I, I've got a question for you because it, I was, I was, man, jazz and leadership. Most of the time you don't necessarily connect those dots, right? How did you, how did that happen? How did you get to, uh, in, in, and, and give our listeners an idea of what you do with jazz, because it's so special. Thank you. Well, I am the CEO of the Jazz Leadership Project, um, which I run in collaboration with my partner in life and business, Drew Kinch Thomas, who's the COO. And what we do is we use the principles and practices found in jazz music, and we apply them to the workplace and to business in particular to leadership development and team excellence. So, I mean, there, there are very strong leadership models in jazz. I mean, first you got to be a leader of yourself by really learning your craft so that your skill set is strong enough to be able to play on stage and actually improvise mm. to, to make aesthetic statements that reflect who you are and what you want to say in the moment, um, in particular in relation to a particular song or a particular mood, uh, and to do that in collaboration with others um, in an ensemble or a group. So the same thing happens at the work, but you got to you know, exercise leadership in your role and what, and what you do and the function that you play within um, the organizations that you are part of. And then you're part usually of groups of people that are working together in concert, like 
consciously use the musical term, uh, in concert to achieve certain goals. So we, we see a very strong tie. And some other companies um, that are very notable uh, have also. So we, we are, we're very happy to have made that, that creative connection. Yeah, I think that's so beautiful, and and I can I can see how uh, music and learning when to play and how to play your instrument well and how to improvise. Uh, how there are so many lessons within that. When did you connect those dots, and how how did this kind of come to be? Well, <clears throat> there's a general connection of the dots where uh, my my love of jazz itself began in a very passionate way in high school. And then through college and, and and after college where I stopped playing, I used to play alto saxophone and other woodwind instruments. And I began writing about the music as a journalist. Mm-hmm. Went to grad school in the late 90s and became a part um, of a group at Columbia University, the, uh, the, a group that started as the jazz study group, which then morphed into the Center for Jazz Studies. Mm-hmm. So I got journalistic background. I've got some scholarly and academic background in relation to the music. Um, and my my wife and I, Jewel, before we launched the Jazz Leadership Project, we actually did um, production work. She has many, many years of experience as a leader in um, in the in the artistic administration. Uh, area. She was the head of the theater of the Riverside Church for over a decade, where she was both the artistic and executive director. Um, and w- like the first major project that we worked on together was in the early 2000s, where we did a tribute to the late great uh, trumpeter Bluehorn Master Clark Terry. Um, and we will you, will you repeat that. that name real quick? I'm sorry, Greg. It, it, yes, Clark Terry. Thank you. Who yeah, he played with the Count Basie Orchestra, Duke Ellington Orchestra, one of the most original stylists on brass and jazz history. Mm-hmm. And we did a tribute to him in the early 2000s and had some other greats. I could go through a whole list of names. But um, we actually started doing some work together then. So it's So we've been together for over 20 years and we've actually been doing work together for, you know, close to 20 years. And and part of that work was actually doing jazz productions all over uh, New York City and parts of Westchester. Uh, We happen to be in in Connecticut now. And so, I mean, we we produced in Harlem um, and and other places, uh, this place, a beautiful place in New Rochelle, that we did work Alvin and Friends restaurant, uh, Alvin Clayton, jazz lover and and restaurateur and artist. And so we actually had experience in the business of jazz. And we started doing work with Jazz at Lincoln Center. It's about six, seven years ago. And they had a, uh, a leadership program in which it was part of the education uh, initiative and the education department they did work with organizations using jazz as a model for leadership. And they ended up putting that project on hold, you know? So we thought it would be a good idea to actually continue doing that work, but under our own banner and in our own way, our own style. Um, And uh, it's been a very fulfilling experience over the last uh, six or so years that's amazing I, you know it reminds me i i once heard of a um it's a leadership program where they bring you in to listen to a symphony or an orchestra and and they essentially every they say well play the music and everybody just plays the music and it's like 
doesn't sound very good. <laughs> and he's like, now play the music the way that uh, that you just want to play it. Be creative. Play it the way you want to play it. So they play it, and it's yeah, it's okay. And uh, and then they play it, and they actually have they actually work together. Okay, now you're going to wait here. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And and now they're going to work in harmony together. And and it was kind of an embodied experience of this is what it looks like when we play our instruments and we play them well, and we get in in sync in concert as you said together we get into that rhythm together now we're making music now we're really uh creating something special and and to see how that could translate into business and i was man that's a that's a really cool experience and now i'm with you and you actually this is something you do you you sit down with these leaders and their teams and you help them find that uh harmony together right and the thing is about harmony you know, in addition to harmony, there's dissonance. Mm-hmm. I mean, with without there being some tension, there won't be release. So, you know, it, it's not a kumbaya harmony. Right. You know, and we all just, there's going to be conflict. There's going to mm. be challenge. There's going to be competition. And what we, we do is we help people through the principles and practices of jazz work through the very challenges that are in business and that are that are in any kind of enterprise where people are working together. Mm-hmm. So we have, for example, a concept. It's one of the, the prime principles that we use, antagonistic cooperation. Mm-hmm. An idea that comes from the hero's journey. And it's an idea that basically says, that rather than looking at challenge, competition, conflict as something that's negative, you actually use it as an opportunity to learn, grow, and advance. Mm -hmm. And it's a shift in perspective for for many. Um, And then you become more welcoming of those challenges because you realize that without challenge, without making mistakes, without those tensions, you're just not going to grow. If everything's cool, then why do you have to put forth more effort? You know? Right. So yeah, it's, it's been, it's been very uh, fulfilling because we are able to show people whether or not they are into jazz or, or like it or know mm-hmm. the history, how they can translate this musical language and these musical principles and practices into their own lives and into their working with other people. Yes. That's beautiful. And so, and I'm a firm believer challenges are opportunities, right? They're just really, that's where we grow the most, you know, and you ask a person how they develop self-reliance, grit, all of these beautiful and important characteristics that we need as life skills um, and characteristics you'll ask them. And a lot of times they'll go back to a challenge. When I was younger, I experienced X, Y, and Z, or my parents separated, or I had to move, or I had to go through this one particular thing. And that it was those challenges that actually created the important life skills that they, that they have. And, uh, and so I see challenges as an opportunity and I really love this antagonistic cooperation. So how does one approach just, just our curiosity? And I really want to get into the fatherhood stuff, but this is, this is also so many of our guys are entrepreneurs, leaders, et cetera. How does one approach uh, a challenge when you have an antagonist or you have uh, an issue going on within an organization, particularly within people problems, because sometimes the, well, I would say business problems are almost always people problems (laughs) in some way or another. Um, so how does one approach that? Well, uh, let's see if I can use a musical a musical metaphor. Um, let's say you have someone who is a soft player, someone who okay, um, you know, very gentle player. I'll give you an extra example for the music. Jim Hall, great guitarist very gentle in his mm-hmm. in his in the way he played much but different he... than stevie ray vaughn <laughs> <laughs> he was, he the, right. heart of, the heart of the pick the better for that guy i think he wanted rocks exactly. for picks uh-huh well he jim hall he 
um, played for a number of years with Sonny Rollins, one of the greatest tenor saxophonists in the history of jazz, who had a big, boisterous, you know, sound. But they blended well together. So you could look and say, well, one is, you know, very soft. The other is more, you know, uh, big, heavy sound. Mm. But they fit together. So the question becomes, can we view what is an antagonist, what is defined as an antagonist, something that rubs against you, something that challenges you? And can we say, okay, rather than saying that is bad, we can say, well, how maybe there's ways that instead of just rubbing that we can complement. You know, so it's, again, it's a perspectival shift, you know, and there, there are many examples in, in life. I mean, just think about this. And this is one of the things we do in our, in our uh, engagements. We have people to look at challenges they've had in life whether it's in the workplace or not. And we have them take note of that particular challenge. And then we ask them to take note of the lessons learned from that challenge. Now, usually you're talking about a challenge in the past, and now you have the present perspective to look at it through. Right. So if you, while you were going through the challenge, we're able to maintain the perspective that, hmm, this is a chance for me to grow, to learn, to get better, to, you know, work through some stuff that I may need to work through. Maybe I'll grow so that I can adjust and become more flexible and adaptable. You know, or if I'm very flexible, adaptable, maybe I'll learn to be more like a drummer where I'm really keeping time. I can be more orderly and I can plan. You have these different stylistic models. Mm -hmm. um, and through that, even when you're going through a challenge and, and, we, and now we're talking about maturity also. That the older you get, hopefully, the more that you realize, you know, certain phrases or expressions are true. You know, they say, don't sweat the small stuff. And yeah. then for the most part, it's all small stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> totally. You know what I mean? You look like the stuff that you really say, man, if I had a known. So the older you get or the more mature you get. And the wiser you get, the more you realize that, you know, challenges are just to be expected. Mm -hmm. the, the, the changes and shifts, we call the syncopation uh, in jazz. You know, the unexpected should be expected because, you know, you can have all the plans you want. Mm -hmm. But life, the reality of life comes in. And other people in other situations are going to cause you to shift those plans. You know, so it, again, it's, I mean, perspective is really, really important. But in our actual engagements, um, you know, we, we try to do 12 month engagements with our clients, at least 12 months. We really give them tools, specific practices, uh, um, micro habits. Uh, one, one of our colleagues, Amel Hansen, he coined that, like micro habits that you can develop. Yeah. So it's not just perspectives, it's also practices that you can engage in to get better and better at the very skills that you'll need to communicate better, to face challenges uh, and conflict better and keep your center, to be able to know when to lean back in a support capacity and when to step up and be out front to solo all of these different skills. And, and as I say this, I'm sure you can just say, wow, these actually do apply not just to music, but to life and to business. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, and I, it's for me, I, I hear so much of, of, my training too and my mentorship and in, in, in business and stuff is this is all stuff that's important you have to embrace challenges my my uh, mentor used to say that the nature of business is problematic 
um, businesses are complex problems. That's what they technically are. And what they are achieving is to achieve the, the solution to a problem. They're almost always trying to solve someone else's problems. And within them, they have their own problems. <laughs> and, uh, and so we have to just stop wishing that there weren't problems. Like that's a big thing. You have to stop. You have to get over the fantasy that you're going to go on this perfect journey with no problems, no challenges, no issues. And that's just not the case. Anytime, any, any day, any, any of your days of life are not necessarily going to be these happy, happy high notes. They're going to have the lows. They're going to have those moments where, you know, there's gotta be a crash. There's gotta be a, a, a something to break up that pattern. And that's life. And the sooner that we get okay with that and get a, and embrace it, uh, the better off we'll be because we're not living in this world where we do have, you know, such a, um, a fallacy in our head and we are then upset because life is just not that way. And, you know, the Stoics were really big practitioners of this. They really believed that challenges were actually gifts. And I loved this reframe, you know, challenges are gifts from the gods and what their gifts from the gods to do is to see if you can step up and become greater than what you were. Like, could you become more of the warrior um, and, and, and actually put your philosophy into practice? Can you step up? And of course, one of my things that I've seen that happens is that when you get a lesson, the universe loves to deliver to you a challenge. <laughs> It's almost as if it's like when you think you know something, it's like, oh, you learned it. Yeah, we'll see if you learned it. <laughs> the universe dishes out a challenge. Can you really show us that you have learned it? And um, and so yeah, so I, I'm hearing so much that it's it, it's very exciting. I, I you know I hope one day I get to work with you and get to experience some of this firsthand because this is the this is really beautiful stuff that you're doing. Thank you so much. You know, you mentioned the Stoics. You know, and I. Think about Ep Epictetus, yes. who's uh, one of my favorite Stoic uh, philosophers, you know, who was actually enslaved. So I, yep. I think about my my cultural and ethnic groups experience, mm. and in, in the United States, and I say, wow, you know, uh, there's wisdom that came out of a Stoic like Ep Epictetus, and there's wisdom that comes out of the Blues in him tradition. Mm -hmm. um, that's a foundation that's a foundation of jazz so you know um there's a kind of a cosmic perspective on life and the blues and blues music that i have that i also bring mm. you know, I, I have um uh, a colleague um and, and, and associate zach stein who talks about um a pre-tragic awareness a tragic awareness, post-tragic, and p-tragic is kind of what you were talking about, but people are, oh, I shouldn't have any problems. Life should be easy. It should be, you know, peaches and cream. Well, that's not real, yes. you know, and childhood is important and having that, that, that um, kind of wide eye perspective is, is beautiful in young people. But then the tragic dimensions of life, part of which is a realization of the reality of death, mm -hmm. cessation of life, uh, or at least a transition to another phase, uh, is really important. And a lot of people get caught in that tragic phase where it's like, you know, uh, they, you know, they look at the, all the bad stuff that's happened in human history. You know, and they focus and emphasize that. And sometimes they can get depressed and they can really just lean on that. But there's also beauty in life. Absolutely. There's also goodness in life, you know, and there's truth as much as that's debated these days. <laughs> <laughs> goodness, tr <laughs> goodness truth and beauty you know yes and so a post-tragic perspective which I, I, the blues idiom represents is a way to look at the tragic realities of life but still and this is that maturity piece but still to realize that 
you if you wake up this morning and you can breathe and you can engage in life itself that life can and should be affirmed and that's what happens through the arts for example that's why the arts are so it's an affirmation of life itself mm. and find joy in small things you know um and don't deny the tragic no the tragic is real but it's not the only reality and it's not the end you can get to a post-tragic perspective where you can embrace the beauty truth and goodness of life even with the tragic that's a beautiful place to be and i hope that those are some of the lessons that that my daughter kaya uh takes from from my writing and from my engagement with her. You know, when you're dealing with your child, you're not necessarily speaking in such theoretical terms. But if you embody these things, then these are lessons that not just in words, but in deed and in behavior, hopefully our children will see. You know, it, there's so much in there that's, that's beautiful to me because so my, some of my favorites you know, thinkers were Victor Frankel, um, Nelson Mandela, you know, some of these people that were in prison, you've mentioned Epictetus, Epictetus in being slaved and what they were all in, in so many ways telling us is that slavery does not happen physically. Like you think, like if you, someone controls your body parts, uh, someone controls what you are able to do with your time. Yes. It's a tragedy. But the tra the real tragedy is not recognizing that you're truly only enslaved when you're allowing your mind to be enslaved. There's some part of you that cannot be captured. And when you get in touch with that, when you get in tune with that, you can recognize that there is freedom in your mind. It is freedom in your spirit. And it is a gift to you, but you have to, you have to discover it. And they did discover it and they tried to share this this meaning with us, you know, and, and this post tragic really is this, this post. And I just love that so much is this post tragic perspective that, you know, those things that were hard for us, they are also beautiful and they're also important and they also have meaning. And if we use them and we don't let them go to waste and, you know, the whole, the old saying is never let a good tragedy go to waste. Um, yeah, that's true. That's true. It's, it's true in a lot of ways. I mean, obviously yeah. it's been political, it's been politicized and, and right. used in, in bad ways too. But at the yeah. same time, um, most of us will recall some of the most important lessons we learned in our life were through hardship. And, you know, we got to be willing and ready to embrace the challenges so that we can grow to new heights and we can help others because that, you there know, we go. I'm right. much, I'm much stronger, uh, having been through a lot of hardship. For example, I've been homeless twice, once with mm. my mother and then once at 18 and, mm. uh, and having gone from literally nothing, um, and I mean like nothing, nothing uh, with my family on welfare and, and all of these things up to a point where, you know, I've been very fortunate, work with, uh, worked with the CEO of the largest real estate company in the world, traveled the world private uh, on private planes, got to meet all kinds of amazing uh, leaders, have had the privilege of visiting many different countries, owning real estate and getting involved in a lot of different things that I that was not my childhood. I'll just say that. And, um, and so having that wide range of experience, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade any of those hard moments or any of those, those sad moments for anything because they're what gave me my skin. You know, they're what gave me uh, my perspective and, and I wouldn't trade that perspective for anything. And so, um, that's beautiful, man. I mean, I, I feel you. I hear you. And um, that exercise that I mentioned that we do for Jazz Leadership Project, we call that exercise challenge as gift. Yes. Challenges are actually gifts from a certain perspective. You mentioned Victor Frankl, mm -hmm. Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are truly heroic figures because mm -hmm. they faced being jailed in Mandela's case for 27 years. In Victor Frankl's case, he 
could have been killed in in the he camps. Been genocide. And, yeah. Right. I mean, and, but to still be able to come through that, and in Frankel's case, develop a, a, a concept he called tragic optimism, which I equate with the blues and the blues idiom, that tragic optimist perspective. Yeah. So definitely, um, you know, without without going through the pain, some pain and suffering, it's difficult to s- relate to other people who go through pain and suffering. I mean, what you mentioned, you know, what you've gone through. Uh, now, I, I would think that some less mature than you might just look at, you know, where you are now and try to distance themselves from what you went through. But I would suspect that the hardships that you went through as a young person helps you feel more compassion for others who have gone through or are going through their own difficulties. Wouldn't that be the case? Oh, 100%. I mean, I've done a number of different bag drives and stuff for homeless people and, and, and provided uh, books, socks, uh, toothbrushes, toothpaste, uh, bottles of water, things that I remember going, man, if I, I just wanted to clean socks. Like I just wanted to feel like I could put my feet into something that wasn't going to, you know, rot my toes off. Um, and so I, I, honestly, uh, I do feel a, a extreme compassion for them. And I, it's, it's tough for me too, because, you know, I live in Austin and we do have a homeless problem and we also have a mental health problem and we have very, like, I know the leadership thinks they're doing the right thing, but I don't see good leadership. I see guys throw their hands up. And I don't see the support of innovation where there are people, there are some really innovative people, obviously here in Austin, there are some very innovative companies here in Austin. I don't see that innovation being driven in the ways that it could be or harnessed or, or embraced and, 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 and supported because there are too many people that are, it's like, a, I think of it as the crab bucket mentality. It's like, you know, and it's within all of us. It's in it. It's in. We see it politically. We see it everywhere. And, it, and it's a very sad thing. In that, um, and I, I don't know how accurate scientifically this metaphor is, but boy, it does draw a good picture. And have you ever heard of the crab bucket? The crab bucket. Describe it to me. Tell me what that is. is. I've heard of. I've heard of crabs in a barrel. Right, crabs in a and barrel. That- Crabs in a barrel kind of thing, same, similar thing. But if you go to cook crabs and you throw live crabs in a barrel or in a bucket, you don't have to put a lid on. Now, they're live. The reason that you don't have to put a lid on is because they won't let each other climb out. Oh, okay. Every time one goes to climb out, the other one gets on its back and they just pull each other right back into the water. And so eventually... They all die and they die because they won't support each other. They won't help each other get out of that bucket. Had they just supported each other instead of grabbing for what was what they could, um, they would have had a different experience. Very similar to uh, to uh, the bears. And this this is a a little different, but uh, similar idea in that the bears in um, Alaska are not the top of the food chain. And I mean, not even above, like not we're obviously we're the top food chain all over there. We're the apex predator. Got it. But given the animal kingdom, what's the apex predator in Alaska? Is it the Kodiak, which is absolutely ginormous. I've seen them firsthand. My goodness. They are very intimidating. No, it's not the Kodiak. The Kodiak is not the apex predator. The, the uh, wolf is the wolf is the apex predator because it works together. It works in a pack. It supports each other in a pack and therefore is way more superior to the Kodiak. The Kodiaks are terrified. In fact, they're so terrified. The way I learned this is because even an old decrepit dog that's on its last leg that is just, just barely even resembles a wolf can actually drive off a bear. I watched a dog that was probably 20 years old (laughs) that looked like an old shag carpet that was walking on four legs. And I mean, I wouldn't have been, if this dog ran at me, I'd have been like, go home, (laughs) you get out of here. But the bears ran from it. And I was like, 
why it seems so illogical why would a bear run from him? and the guy said because he thinks that might be a you know a random weird wolf and as long as it's a wolf he's he, he gonna they're not gonna have anything to do with it i hear you man again perspective it's perspective Persp- perspective you know but that case from a, a bear you know and what what they associate yep. with you mentioned homelessness. I just want to mention this very briefly mm. um, as we pivot to talking about parenthood. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned the homelessness problem, um, and you also mentioned in the very beginning that I'm a senior fellow at the Institute for Culture Evolution. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steve McIntosh, the founder of the Institute for Culture Evolution, mm. has been um, writing a series of position papers that use this concept of cultural intelligence to deal with real life social problems. And there is a position paper on homelessness that's been done that uh, comes from what's you know, it's called an integral perspective. But, in, in, but basically, you know, what are some traditional values, right? And virtues that people have, what are modern, values and virtues what are postmodern values and virtues Mm -hmm. and finding a way to integrate the best of those perspectives so that there's buy-in from people who are coming from those particular worldviews or perspectives Mm -hmm. you know so i don't want to mention that there there are ways of looking at and dealing with these problems um, and you're right. There is a big lack of leadership, particularly uh, in a political class. That's why I tend to focus more on culture, mm-hmm. and cultural development and cultural intelligence as a way that we can share meaning, share values, share practices, share perspectives, um, share our passions and our loves And do it in a way where we can respect the differences among us Mm -hmm. and also find a basis for working together and collaborating to uh, make things better for us all. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm a big I'm a big cultural fan. I don't I do not have for me personally, and obviously I'm going to put out a a personal perspective here, but I don't want us to all be the same, man. I love culture. I like my family is from Louisiana. Don't take away my Louisiana culture. You know, don't (laughs) take away that Creole. Don't take away that music. Don't take, don't take that away. And then my, my, uh, my parents, my mother is native American and my son's middle name is Alo, which is actually Hopi. Uh, and, and the reason that we gave him a Native American middle name is because I don't want him to lose the fact he looks, when you look at him, you'll never think that that kid has Native American blood in him, but he does. And the same was for me. And, and, and so many people, there are very few people that speak Cherokee anymore, you know, and, and um, we're just seeing a culture that's losing uh, you know, it's losing itself. It's dying slowly. And, and eventually after a few generations, you, there'll be very little that people really think of around native Americans, but especially for me, having my parents grow up in Oklahoma, my grandmother being from sky took like my grandfather living on the reservation, that's like important. And how are we going to keep, how are we going to preserve that you know how are we going to keep that life there because it takes that, leadership it takes yeah. culture bearers it takes lineage holders and there are good people doing it which you know i get right. luckily i am signed up for uh you know like i get the newsletter and stuff like that and we're involved with some of it but it is interesting it's something that's very important to me one quick thing that came up and i want to make sure that you guys hear about this because this is one of the most important books i've ever read in my life and i think you would really enjoy it uh greg it's called left to tell and it's by a woman by the name of immaculate illabagiza and it is her story from the hutus and the tutsis genocide and it is a firsthand story Uh, i met this woman she's a survivor and it's a testimony. Uh, it's really actually, um, she's qu- quite religious. It's a testimony to God. Um, but the story has in it so many important messages, m- mainly around having faith and also seeing the best in human beings, even when they're not displaying their best. Mm. 
and is a very, very, very powerful message. It's a beautiful book. She is a beautiful individual, just inside and out, super radiant. I feel like we, when I was around her, I was like, this is some, like her energy felt like I was around a saint. She is so pure, sweet, good, loving, and just like, oh, just all good things. And uh, anyways, it's called Left to Tell. Very good read. Not a not a long book, but a very, very powerful read. Um, and if you're into the Nelson Mandela, you're into um, things like this, these stories of tragedy, but also of that post-tragic perspective, as well as um, seeing really having faith and stuff. This is a very powerful book. Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, it, it reminds me of... Um, a concept that we use in Jazz Leadership Project. Um, big ears is one of the main practices that we have, and it's deep listening. And we do three levels, active listening, where you're present, you're there, um, empathetic listening, where you open your heart, and then generative listening. And part of generative listening you can, and this is uh, Otto Sharma, theory, theory you can co-create the future together, is when you are listening to someone and you're communicating with them, you actually listen with their best self in mind. Ooh, I love that. See, so so that when you said that about, about that author of Left to Tell, it reminded me of that. You know, so when we're dealing with each other, that it's like, you know, when you when you're raising children, look, that's that's they, they, exactly where they, I was they're thinking. gonna go through certain phases of development. Yes, but as a parent, you know that they're going through certain phases, and it's your job to help guide them to create a space where they can become who they are, mm-hmm. and you're doing it in a way where if you're mature, if you have some self-awareness and you have a, an understanding of maybe some of the things you went through as a child and growing up and being parented, certain things that you will carry forth from that, there's certain things that you won't. And you realize that if I deal with my child in a way where I am going to be looking at her as a growing being, a developing being who will be and become more than he or she is now. Their best level, their best self can come forth. And it's our job to help that happen. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So it, the it actual root too. meaning. A hundred percent. The root is a, when you said that, and I was thinking, man, listen to the best, you know, while thinking of the best that version of them, I was thinking, man, that is such a good lesson for children because, you know, it's so easy to get caught up in the moment. You're upset about the Legos on the ground or the spilled milk or whatever. And, you know, sometimes we're talking to our children And it's easy when you have become overwhelmed or something like that to not be seeing the best in your child. You actually start seeing the worst in them and you get triggered by every little mistake. I just made a video yesterday. Um, We haven't posted it yet, but it was about the idea of ignore, distract, and redirect and how those are often more powerful than paying attention to all those little tiny things that are annoying, those little annoying behaviors, those little moments and stuff. Because if you focus on those and you get triggered by those and you uh, put too much energy into those, you might accidentally one, give your child a power trip where they actually are getting negative hits of power, but two, you expand that in them. They might actually take on the belief, which is the reason I'm doing this fatherhood work is because of the belief my son took on. That was a mistaken belief that came from my inherited parenting uh, techniques. See, my inherited parenting techniques had a fundamental flaw. The flaw was the belief that if my child wasn't doing the right thing, I just have not given him a big enough consequence. Oh, wow. Okay. 
So, uh, you know, I'd talk to my dad or my parents about, or, or my brothers about my brother or my son's misbehavior. They'd say, you need to whoop his ass. No, you, man, you, I'd ground him for a month. We'll take the door off of his hinges. I wouldn't give that kid a video game for anything if he acted like that. And he got to a place where my son had no games, no privileges, a door off of his wall. He had been spanked. He had been yelled at. He had done all. I did all those things. He had been grounded. For all you dads out there that old school, I know you're hearing me. Well, let me tell you something. I got to a place where my son was still misbehaving. And I'd be, I wouldn't, I don't think it's a stretch to think that if you've tried these old school tactics that you might still have a misbehaving child. And I had this occur and it was because this faulty belief. Mm -hmm. And it got to a point where my son said to me one day while crying, I am sorry, dad. Now, I get a little emotional about this. Sure. I'm sorry, dad. I don't mean to make you and my teachers angry. I'm just a bad kid. Oh, oh, that hurt, man. That had to hurt. Ooh. And, uh, man, gets me. I mean, that really gets me. So, anyways, I got. Because um, you could think, because there's no way you want like, your child no. to totally think that and believe right. that, but to say it. Yes. So, what t I'm, I'm so, I'm so curious about this story which caused a pivot in your parenting yes, so yes. what did you what did you do man? so i knew right there i said honey no 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 you are not a bad kid because i can tell he's taking on his identity no you are a human with bad habits i got bad habits every person has bad habits your teachers have bad habits it's not you it's you know, and I, I started reading these books because I said, you know what, I've got, this is not you. There's something wrong here. And it's part of, it's partly me. Something in my parenting is wrong here. And uh, it was that fundamental belief that I needed to make him feel worse to make him, to help him do better. And I read Jane Nelson's book, Positive Discipline, and she talked about this. And I, I was reading and I was like, oh my gosh, this is where I'm at. This is exactly where I'm at. And uh, she said, you know, there's a great quote, and I quote her all the time for this. It said, where did we ever get the silly idea that we have to make children feel worse in order for them to do better? It's illogical. It's, it, it doesn't make any sense, but we were working <laughs> off that. We were working off that premise for a long time. It's amazing how emotional that moment gets for me. But that was sure, that man. that's the pivotal moment. That is the pivotal yeah. moment for me. It's why I'm doing this work. I'm doing this work because I want to help dads out there who are still operating under that broken belief yeah. that you don't have to do this to your kids. You can have a better relationship with them and you can get better results through respect, through mutual respect, through understanding, through helping them see that their challenges are human challenges you had them i had them sit still and be quiet well that's almost impossible when you're little right. <laughs> you know it's not it, that's not a normal for your child to that's struggle exactly. with that he wants everything in the store so do you <laughs> you're just lying to yourself if you say you don't but but you've learned how to control it he does too so um so yeah, so it was very, very important thing. And so seeing the best where this got, where this came for me is when we said, listen to them while thinking of the best them, the best version of them. And I could have that kind of wrong, but was that right, Craig? Greg? No, that's right. Yeah, the best, you know, think of think of them like you know, a best version of them. Right. Their their higher self. I mean, there's any, yes. any number of ways you're of speaking to it. their Absolutely. higher self. You're speaking right. to the better version of them. Right. And when you do that, you're, this is what my experience has been. When you do that to an individual, your body chemistry changes, your facial expressions change, your judgment changes. And then in them, they get to be, they get to show up in that better way. 
Now, the opposite is also true. When you see the worst in them while trying to correct them, your body chemistry has changed, your facial expressions have changed, and then them, they're defensive. Let me ask you a question. When I attack you or I say something to you, if I were to make you, uh, you know, stand on your heels, are you going to hear me? Are you going to listen to me? Or are you going to sh- clam up and shut down? So if you really want your children to hear, you got to listen to them, seeing the best version of them. I really love that generative listening. I think that was the one. Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the thing, I mean, I think about my own experiences <clears throat> as a parent and, you know, all parents are going to make mistakes. All parents are going to do certain things or not do certain things that they realize later if they have a communication with their children uh, that harmed or even traumatized Mm. their their child. Um, It's almost inevitable. Let's say on the other end of the scale, let's say that you have uh, a child who materially has everything, at least on the surface, or, you know, they, 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 they've got all the things that they should have in terms of food, clothing, shelter. But there's a parent who, because they're working and they're, you know, just, you know, they're conquering this and that, and they're bringing home the bacon they don't spend enough time with the child. Yeah. There's not of enough of emotional connection. Yeah. There's certain things in the development of the child that's missed. So in my, my own situation, um, I, I was very fortunate. Um, my daughter, Kaya, her mother and I, we actually separated and divorced fairly early in her life. Hmm. Um And it was something that was hurtful to both of us because we both came from what they call broken homes. And we had committed ourselves to not do that to our children. But as we know, you know, as you are relatively young and in relationships that you're just growing and getting to know yourself as an adult and there's certain things that you know, levels of compatibility, all kind of stuff. And I'll, I'll just give you, a, for instance, you, you've you touched on a pivotal moment for you, and I'll touch on two for me. Mm-hmm. So um, we had physically separated. Um, she was on Staten Island, um, and I was in Harlem. And... I came to visit and spend some time and I'm holding my daughter. She may be one half, two at the time. And I realized that, oh my God, I am not going to be able to be with her every day Mm. because I wasn't going to be fighting for custody. A mother's a good mother, you know, so we Mm. worked it out, you know, joint custody and all that stuff. But man, I started crying at that realization. And I cried from there to the Staten Island Ferry, all on the Staten Island Ferry ride, from downtown Manhattan, all the way up in tears, man. And so that was one instance I realized that. Then there was another instance. So she was older. She was like seven, eight years old. She came and she stayed. Uh, with me. Maybe she was more like five, six. And at the time, her mom wasn't letting her, and neither my mother or grandmother was letting her in the kitchen. So I said, well, you know, I can, we can cook some eggs together. So you know, crack the eggs and let her beat them, and you know, that kind of thing. So we're sitting there eating breakfast together. And she says, Daddy, do you think that you could come and live next door to me and mommy. Oh my God. Oh, it was like a knife, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then, I mean, not necessarily at that moment, because I dealt in the situation, but 
I thought back to instances of talking to my own father and saying, well, couldn't you and mom just, you know, because kids don't, they don't understand, you know, those adult relationships, Yeah, you know? So one of the things that I feel very blessed about is that not only would my daughter visit and stay on the weekends and I'd take her to the Harlem School of the Arts and we would go to bookstores and she would run free in the young adult section, the children's section and stuff and develop a voracious love of reading that became the foundation of her educational path. You mentioned Mm -hmm. uh, that she's in graduate school at MIT now. Yes. She's brilliant. She is a brilliant young lady. And uh, I'm so proud of her. But like any young person, you're going to go through growing pain. So she actually, after she graduated from junior high school, she came to live with Jewel and me in New Rochelle. And she went to high school, New Rochelle High School. And that's a very pivotal time emotionally for any young person. So there are certain growth, growing pains, you could say. Um, And for her to be, for me to be with her every day. And at the time I was uh, the New York Daily News jazz columnist. And I was able to, you know, be there at the different things she was doing, you know, at school and this and that, support her. But even then, there were things that I missed. There were moments that she needed a certain response and I didn't give it, you know? So uh, she had graduated from New Rochelle High School. She had um, gotten accepted to Dartmouth College. And we're walking from our home in New Rochelle to the Larchmont train station. And she unloaded, man. She was like, you know, I I don't think I'm going to ever come here again, you know. And she telling me stuff that I missed and I did I wasn't aware of and this and that. And I'm like, whoa, baby, I just, I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm sorry. And she said, you know, I feel better getting that out. So sometimes we just have to engage in that deep listening. We have to let our children emote and just listen and not always feel that you have to be right. Mm -hmm. Just listen, just be present sometimes. And that active listening, that empathetic listening, that generative listening, let them express. You know what I mean? So well, this, so I, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, there's a great uh, principle uh, also taught by Jane Nelson, which is that children will listen when they felt listened to. There it is. That's right. It's that's, that's human right. beings. I mean, if you look at right. seven habits of high, highly effective people, seek first to understand and then to be understood. understood. Boy, children, is. that works so well with children. Exactly. You know, if you can say to a child, for example, hey, honey, it looks like you're feeling like you need some attention. You know, can you come here real quick? Something like that. Or, hey, honey, it seems like you feel disempowered. You don't feel like you've had a lot of choices today. I can see that you're really reaching for some power. How about this? What would you like to do for this evening's activity or what would you like to eat? Would you like to eat this or that? You know, giving them a little bit of choices because sometimes with children, especially the little ones, they don't get choices. Everybody else tells them what to do. Everybody else tells them where they're going to sit, what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink. And then when you start to see a power struggle at the end of the evening and you just tell them, you just get in line and listen. (laughs) <laughs> well, a, they, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, th- there's a struggle. very, very important concept, agency. Mm-hmm. I mean, as adults and as parents, one of our jobs is to prepare our children to become adults, mm-hmm. to become contributing members in the culture, in the society. And one way you do that is by them developing and exercising agency. Mm. 
a sense that I can actually impact the world, my world, you mm -hmm. know, where I am, my relationships, the, 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 the places that I go, the environments that I'm in, I actually can have positive influence there. Mm -hmm. But young people need help. They, you know, it, it's a wonderful idea, you know, of the sovereign individual, but the reality is that none of us do this shit alone. <laughs> and our kids, our, kid, our kids can't either. You know nope. what I mean? So we so can't we do it help alone. them develop agency. And I'll never forget, she did come back and visit. She she did you know she she as she got older she looked back at herself she she was telling me um, a year or so ago she said oh my god daddy I I know I put you and Jewel through some stuff boy I did, you know <laughs> <laughs> they all, man teenagers have all those hormones everything going through you know I'm glad we're getting into this I actually have a handful of questions that I'd love to ask you and sure. uh, one of them is you know what are some of these I mean. First of all, congratulations having a daughter at MIT. That is, I I can only imagine how much pride you guys have in your family for the work that she's put in, the effort that she's put in, yes. the type of diligence and just the, MIT is just a very special place. And yes. it's, it's held for very special people who are putting in work. They're putting in some very, uh, they're putting in a lot of effort and they're, yes. and they're very bright. And uh, they're exercising agency. And they're exercising <laughs> incredible agency. Yes. And I'm and I'm curious to know what were some of the key principles or the big ideas that you guys um, instilled in Kaya, uh, and and some of the things that maybe you guys said in your home or some of those ideas that you guys were talking about related to maybe education or related to work or you know something that you could tap into that was important in yeah. terms of building that foundation. Right. Well, one of the things that Blessed to have a daughter, Kaya, who, as I mentioned earlier, she began to read voraciously. She was devouring books. So it mm. wasn't like we had to push her academically. Mm. She really was self motivated academically. She really had a sense of direction early in high school where she started to. Um, do more work in the scientists and and co-lead a science camp for girls and that type of thing. Um, so it was more creating a space through which and around which she could flourish mm -hmm. and come into her own. I mean, I was similar in, in many ways to an approach that Went Marsalis's father took with him. Went Marsalis's father, the great pianist, late pianist, uh, Ellis Marsalis, New Orleans, you mentioned New mm -hmm. Orleans. And he never pushed his sons to become musicians, but they all did. I never pushed, see, so it's not so much like, you know, a, a, a particular phrase or an expression or mm -hmm. a axiom that I shared or we shared with, uh, with Kaya. It wasn't so much that it was more creating a space through which, uh, in which she could flourish and come into her own, mm -hmm. right? So one of the things that Winton's father, Ellis Marsalis, um, one of the things he would he would do is like very similar, interestingly enough, to Kaya. Uh, when Winton Marsalis left home, he was like, "I'm I'm 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 going to New York," you know what I mean? <laughs> and he was going to Juilliard, and he was going to play and stuff. And uh, his father said to him, "Well, uh, and he had packed all his stuff, and he was about to go." So he said, "You you, you said you okay?" Winton was like, "Yeah." He said, now, the stuff that you have, you're, you're cool with that, right? Yeah. He said, never forget that. You are okay right now with what you have. Mm 
You know, so there's certain lessons. So I never pushed Kaya to go in any particular direction. I mean, so many times, oh, become a lawyer, become a doctor, you know, <laughs> these kind of things that, you know, those are good aspirations. But um, I know that I felt coming up uh, confined or, you know, somewhat irritated by it. So what are you going to do? What are you going to be? You know, right. and it's okay to ask those questions, but it's, it's something that adults do very often with young people. And it's really hard for a young person to really know the answer to that. So they come up with some stuff. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a this. I want to be a right. So with regard to Kaya, she took an interest, and I just love this about her, whether it was studying for the SAT several years before she needed to study, before she even took the PSAT. Uh, her researching colleges several years before to really, I mean, she just so self-motivated. Mm. And she ended up being very interested in environmental engineering mm. and applying to Dartmouth early decision because they had a great environmental engineering program. Now, very interesting. And the transition from junior high school to high school was one of the major disappointments, one of the major antagonistic cooperation experiences for my daughter early on. She applied to the specialized high school, Bronx High School of Science, Brooklyn Tech, she didn't get accepted into any of them. Hmm. She was crestfallen. She was oh. distraught. Her mother and I had a conversation. Remember I said she's a good mother? She said, look, and it's Tina. She said, look, I don't want Kaya to go to the local high schools here in Staten Island. It's great that you were able to go to Tottenham. I went to Tottenham High School and I was able to go to Hamilton College from there and develop, you know, through many fits and starts, a relatively successful career decades later. I mean, it, it took a long time for me to get where I am now. Mm. She said, you know, you're really the one that, in terms of her education, that really should be taking the lead. So, you know, I think she should really come and stay with you and Jewel to go to a very good public high school, New Rochelle High School in New Rochelle. And it was a dream come true for me because I always dream, dreamt of Kaya being with me during her high school years, those pivotal years. So she went through her high school years, those adjustments, and when she heard back from Dartmouth and they said, yes, it was incredible affirmation for her. And she just, I mean, she had already flowered in high school, but she just boom from there, you know? So we have to provide space for our children to grow. We have to provide affirmation for our young people, for our children. And we have to be okay with them being challenged. We have to know they're going to go through disappointment. And it's okay. Be there for them. Listen to them. You know, don't, don't fall prey to what Jonathan Haidt talked about in the coddling of the American mind. Don't over coddle your children. Absolutely. You know, I mean, yep. let them... They're going to play, give them space to play. They're going to nick their need. They're going to, you know, you want them to be safe, of course, but they have to experience certain things growing up, right? Mm -hmm. So they got to be affirmed, but they also have to be able to face challenges, make mistakes and learn from it. So it's the same, similar principles. Right. It's just applying it to, to parenting, you know? Mm -hmm. So because we were so blessed to have, uh, a, a young lady who was so self-motivated, it wasn't like we had to give her a lot of, you know, um, a lot of advice in terms of academic development. Right. Emotional development is another story. Mm. There's certain experiences 
that, you know, in terms of the emotional development, um, that, that you'll be there for, for your children. And a lot of times, you know, these levels or these lines of development happen at different stages, cognitive, emotional uh, development, interpersonal skills. You know, she's, she's very special because she has a combination of technical understanding. I mean, she's a computer scientist. Mm -hmm. I mean, she graduated in computer science at Dartmouth, went on to work at Slack. Uh, and Calm that has the Calm app. Mm -hmm. um, she has done internships, you know, at some of the big companies out here. But she's also very, very uh, heartfelt, loving, compassionate as a person, great communicator. So she's mm -hmm. got an incredible skill set, kind of a whole being that mm -hmm. she brings to the table. A lot of people have, you know, they might have technical skills and right. they might have, uh, you know, very uh, analytical. Knowledge. She's got the analytical and the synthetical. Yeah. She's got the left brain and the right brain, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I mean, so you have to know your child, but also realize that they, as growing beings, are going to be transforming and changing. Um, and hopefully you'll be growing and transforming and, and, and maturing with them. Uh, I was going to tell you th this anecdote about her coming back to, to, to New Rochelle, but I'll never forget. She came back to, to, to visit. This is when she was uh, in college, first, first semester. And she had girlfriends, you know, because she went to New Rochelle High School. So she went to, she said, Daddy, I'm going to spend time with my, my girlfriend. And she didn't ask me. She told me she was going out. I was like, oh, shoot. I didn't say anything. But I was like, oh, oh, we're at that phase of our relationship <laughs> where she's not asking to go out. She's <laughs> telling me she got, oh, okay, you know. Right. <laughs> so we have to be ready for these different uh, changes that, 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 our, that our children will uh, take us through and as we help them go through their changes and transitions. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's so good. I love that giving them space, letting them find their own path, but nurturing it along with them, allowing them to find those challenges within that path and not trying to over protect them from those or get in the way uh, when those could be extremely important. And even on purpose, it could be on purpose in some way we look back, we go, Hmm. You know, Kaya wouldn't have lived with dad had she gone to those middle schools. She might not have been in that high school with you, might not have gotten to Dartmouth. Who knows? We don't know. We never know. But those things could happen for a reason. And uh, and most of all, I was, you know, I'm hearing a lot about creating this kind of warmth where and 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 really like a humble perspective, too, and that. I am seeing you become something as opposed to I am creating you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And you got to set examples. How you right. live your life is as important as what you say. Yeah. As what you, you know, uh, demand or command. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, she, by virtue of, and, you know, and, and you, you look at these situations, okay, you can say, oh, she grew up in a broken home. Well, no, that's not how I put it. She had a, 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 a biological father in me and a stepmother in Jewel. She had a biological mother in Tina and a stepfather in Tina's husband, Tony. And by virtue of being exposed to both of us, she was able to see different relationships. She was able to learn lessons when con from both. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So how we frame things, that perspective again, is really key. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. So she was blessed to have, you know, not only support from, each of us as the primary caregiver, but from extended family, aunts and uncles and cousins and such uh, on both sides of the family. So, I mean, we, for example, we just 
had a family reunion. Um, we are the Thomas branch of the Hightower family. And since 1979, we've been having uh, biannual family reunions. And this last one, which was the first one in three years because of COVID, mm. we were in Dallas together, you mm. know, and she was able to meet you know, new cousins who she hadn't met before, who had movers and shakers in the same generation as her, you know. So, again, I feel, I just feel very blessed that uh, Kaya Thomas is is my daughter and that Jewel Kinch Thomas, my beloved wife, uh, as she was transitioning from being a teenager to a young adult, could be uh, a direct daily example of a, of a woman of deep integrity, creativity, warmth, and high standards. And those high standards sometimes cause some conflict, you know, with the growing Kaya, you know. <laughs> so, you know, but it's it's all good now. As, as those as standards are are so important. Um, you know, as we, I've been doing the studying on parenting and it's, it's not fun for our children to experience standards, high standards. It's a lot like sandpaper or a rock tumbler. Um, mm -hmm. at the same time, they appreciate their polish at the end of it all. <laughs> yeah. exactly. That's a good, that's a good metaphor. Absolutely. That's right. Um, that's right. Now, I am curious, uh, so what were some of the rules or structures that you guys had in place regarding her childhood? And even the a rules teenage structures. Life? Oh, well. Like, well, were I you, mean, a, would you consider you guys fairly strict, permissive? Did she have oh, late curfews, early curfews? Okay. What were okay. some of those guiding boundaries yeah. and, and how mm -hmm. did you guys work? Well, one of the things that caused some some conflict uh, when she joined us was that, well, you remember the household now, and we all do chores. Right. Family contributions are everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we all clean, cook, do dishes, the whole night. So there was some resistance to some of those things. <laughs> <laughs> As any teenager would have, we understand. You know, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, she, during high school, um, she didn't have boyfriends in high school. Not because, I mean, I would joke with her and say, well, I got my shotgun. <laughs> Right. You know? <laughs> I just, you know, just I, go I ahead say, and invite him over for dinner. I was saying that all through <laughs> high school. But it's so interesting. I'm sorry. It was it was so interesting that she didn't have any boyfriends. So she was just really hanging out with her girlfriends. But she was so studious, you know what I mean, with her work and her research and her reading that um, there wasn't, you know, she had a curfew. There were certain times she had to be home, but there was no problem with that. She she, right. she was fine with that. Um, and she was fine with doing the housework after a while because it's right. just the expectation, the standards, you know? Yeah. Now, but when she went to college, and this is so interesting, let me share this. So she comes home after her first semester, and she says, Daddy, I need to talk to you, and I need you to sit down. I was like, oh, Lord. Because parents, you know, <laughs> it's like, now, <laughs> I said, and, it, you know, knowing my daughter, I shouldn't have said that. I said, please don't tell me you're pregnant. Right. She says, Daddy. <laughs> she says, Daddy. Right. No, I'm not even doing. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she says, "No, I have a boyfriend." Oh boy, his name is Theo, and I know you know. With, with the, uh, you know, and I, I told mommy first, and I told grandma first, you know, but. I said, okay, well, tell me about Theo. You know, he was a math major at the time, Dartmouth. They, they, they met actually the, the summer before they both went in. Then they met when they went, you know, as, in the members of the same freshman classes from Jamaica originally. And so 
I met him. And at first she said, well, daddy, when you meet him, I want to be there. Cause she just didn't trust that I wasn't right. going to like grill him, you know? <laughs> yeah. But you know, I did. 21 I did. questions with the shotgun in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did meet him the first time I went, met him and he was involved in sports. And did, so it was just a, a brief meeting. But the next time I went, we met at the Hanover Inn, which is in the center of Dartmouth's, uh, not center, but, you know, on Dartmouth's campus. And uh, we sat down and we spoke. And Kaya left so we could speak. So we had small talk and this and that. What are your interests and this and that? So I didn't do what is not fair to young people. I don't think it's fair. To, well, my intentions as far as my daughter. No, but I did say, what do you like about Kaya? Yeah. Great. He gave the per answer without hesitation. Mm-hmm. He said everything. Uh, <laughs> That's great. I got to write that one down. I'm going to remember that answer. It's easy. One word. Everything. <laughs> okay. You know, and he was a respectful, smart, mannerable young man you know what i mean and they actually are now husband and wife oh wow and he is doing his graduate work booth uh, uh business school at university of chicago and she's at mit doing the engineering mba and, but he's actually doing an internship at a financial firm in boston so they've actually been able to be together you know, while they're in grad school in different places, it's, it's wonderful. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm so happy that she found her love early and actually, you know, uh, didn't have to go through some of the relationship, either horrors or, you know, tragedies or hurts that so many young people, you know, have to go through, you know. So um, I'm, I'm just... I'm in their corner, wishing them the best, and so far so good, you know. So you know, we we, you know, again, we 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 set an example. It's like she saw our relationship. She saw, you know, how we interacted. I mean, my my wife Jewel and I, we we've been together for over 20 years, married since 2008, and we are best friends. We do our business together. We love being with each other. And and Kaya saw that. So she had an example of a, a real relationship with, with you know, with, uh, with warmth and all the positive qualities of communication and interaction that we find in the Jazz Leadership Project. And so, you know, she is employing that herself in her 20s you know so yeah i i mean if there's a past life you guys must have did something good in it because you, <laughs> <laughs> you definitely you definitely have a beautiful and blessed life that's that is for sure um you know i guess one thing i want to ask is what would be the best advice you would have for some other fathers out there that are listening and um something that you feel is important in terms of being a, a great father. Thank you. I mean, let me speak from the heart here. Um, realize that your child is a unique individual. They came through you. You have the responsibility, obviously, to be there for them as they grow, as to help them in the challenges and changes through that process but have a balance between structure and freedom that's what you find in jazz they need structure they definitely need that they need order but they also need the ability within that structure and order to find their own way, to make their own mistakes, to come into who they are. Each of us has an individual 
fingerprint and footprint. That's mm -hmm. ours alone. So you have a unique individual who you have the responsibility to help develop, but they are a unique soul. And if you do your job right, and can at least give them the foundation upon which they can then be in the world as adults, they will show and hopefully contribute to where they live, to their own family, to their own uh, uh, gender group, ethnic group, all of these different groupings. But as a unique individual, they'll be able to come into their own. And then you could be proud that they are an individual expression of what do they say? What, what what's the spiritual expression? A uh, spiritual being having a human experience, right? Because it goes deeper than just you know. Um, I think our humanity in this lifetime. I think there's something about you know lineage and ancestry and you know there's a there's an african perspective that you know the generations that came before are to be honored and we need to to do our best to make sure that the generations to come have a great or a a, a firm foundation upon which they can come into their own mm -hmm. so you know they're part of a line of development in your family, you know? So let them come into their own, but they'll need structure and some freedom to do that, just like in jazz. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much, Greg. I really appreciate your time, uh, your words, your energy. Um, I'm very inspired by you, and I am really grateful to have had you on. Thank you so much, Brandon. I so appreciate you inviting me to talk about uh, my experience as a dad. Thank you. So guys, if you haven't already, please do uh, subscribe and be sure to like this. Um, share us with your friends. Let us reach more fathers out there. And we thank you for tuning in today. We hope you have a beautiful and blessed day. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you've received some value from it, please share it with other dads and consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform, and we'll see you in the next episode. Looking for support with your fatherhood journey? Go to BeDadly.com and take our Dadly Disposition quiz and learn helpful insights on how you can overcome power struggles with your kids. 